Well, thank you, Pastor. I'd like to say it's an honor and a privilege to be up here. It's always an honor to speak God's word to his people. And uh, it's been, uh, I've had a great time here serving at um, a Crossroad Church. It's been, it's been a great blessing in my life and my wife's life. So again, thank you, Pastor, for giving me this opportunity. And though we prayed, I'd like to open up in prayer. So please go to me and the, uh, to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us this time to come together. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to honor you and to bring you praise and to say how wonderful you are, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being such a mighty God. I pray that you bless the message today, Lord, that you, you put it upon our hearts and have people not pay attention to the speaker, but to the message, to the raw gospel, Lord. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, today's message title would be called Raw Gospel. And I hope that that message gets across. The passage we're going to be teaching, uh, I'm going to be teaching out of today, is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And earlier today, we reread uh, the prior context, but I'm just going to start from verse 31 of chapter 1 and go through chapter 2, verse 5. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in, and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but built but in demonstration of, of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. To give a brief context, Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, and he visited them, he established the church, and he went away. But what he heard was that the church members were now all of a sudden becoming puffed up in that they were saying that, well, I have adopted the philosophy of Apollos, one of the apostles. I have adopted the philosophy and the teaching of Peter. Well, I have Paul. Well, I have of Christ. I'm the, I'm the top because I follow after Christ. They were in a state of becoming snobbish and causing division, saying, well, I know the best way of living the Christian life. I know the best way of delivering the gospel to people. I know the best way. And the people were looking down upon each other. Well, you follow this guy. Well, you follow this guy. And Paul's like, no. Guys, what are you doing? Don't you guys remember where you came from? Why are you thinking you amounted to something great now because you follow a particular preacher? You follow a particular philosophy. Paul's, remember where you came from. Remember that you guys were not the most smartest of people. You guys weren't the most highest esteemed when I came to you. You guys weren't the strongest people around. Remember where you guys came from. Remember what the whole message of Christianity is about. Now, it's easy if Paul just left it there. He could just point fingers. Point, 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 done, walk away. But Paul didn't do that because he served by leading. Or he, 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 lead, he, lead, he led by serving, excuse me. And what he did is something that a lot of people probably wouldn't do. He decided to expose himself and how he came to them. And he's going to bring back a memory of when he first approached them. In, cha in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And I, meaning also I, so I'm pointing the finger at you guys, but now I'm going to switch that finger and point it right back out of myself. He says, When I came to you brothers, brothers referring not just to males, but family, 
male and females. He said, when I came to you, my family, remember, we are family here. I am part of you. I am not separate from you, but I am part, I'm a part of you guys. Remember, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God. Proclaiming. Meaning that he wasn't just going out and just preaching, standing in the middle of the aisles and just saying the word of God out loud. But proclaiming means speaking, being involved, living a Christian life in front of them. When I came proclaiming to you the testimony of God, I'll read to you what the testimony of God. Let me, let me place that into context. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 through 12, I'll read it to you. This is the testimony that he is talking about, the testimony of God. And John happens to say the same thing. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the, has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. He says, when I came to you guys to tell you that God, the father, God, the ultimate, God, the alpha, the omega, without a beginning, without an end, the God who is in control of everything, who upholds everything together, who gives the very breath that you and I breathe, who knows the numbers on your head, who places men all over the world, who controls our life, who owns everything. When I came to you to tell you about the great news of the fact that we now have eternal life, to tell you that there is a way to come to God, that he sent his son down. When I came to you with this wonderful, her, uh, wonderful news, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with lofty speech or wisdom. I didn't speak to you in that way. Lofty speech or wisdom, it's referring back to, I didn't have a high rhetoric, a high standard. I didn't speak to you guys in order to strike the emotional cord, to have tears run from your eyes and convince you with my profound speech. I didn't come to you like the debaters of your time. I didn't come to you to try to convince you with, with just words, with a, with, a, with a body language that would bring all men and eyes and ears to watch me. And I didn't come to you with wisdom, with a cleverness, which of, hey, that's, that, that, that's a good point. Or, hey, that's a nice way that he uh, tied that together. I didn't come to you like that. I didn't come to you with amazing speech. He says, you know how I came to you? He said, I decided, or better, meaning that I made sure to make nothing known among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, it's interesting, he said, I decided to come to you and know nothing. Not teach. He chose specifically the word know. Not preach, but know nothing among you. He says, I was not worried. I was not concerned with my image, with the methods, with the, how can I grab their attention? How am I going to keep these people to keep listening to me? I wasn't concerned about that, he says. He says, I was concerned. My conscience was bound not by a method, but by the raw gospel. My conscience to know was bound by knowing Jesus Christ and him crucified, by ev meaning everything I did, my relationships, my thoughts, my words was bound within just knowing Christ and him crucified. I wasn't, he says, I wasn't worried about anything else. I could have spoke to you like that, but I, that's not how I wanted to do things. I just wanted you to focus in on the gospel. That's all I wanted. And what are you guys doing now? That's what he was, he was you guys are on the wrong path, he was stating. Just focus in on the gospel with Jesus Christ and him crucified, talking about the, not, he didn't, he says, I, when he was saying crucified, I didn't come to you guys stating that this was a new way of life, meaning that, hey, 
you know, self-sacrifice. That's a great way to live. Or, hey, positive thinking. He says, no, I came to you with Christ crucified, meaning that he spoke to them about the atonement, about the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the resurrection of Christ, the, the love of Christ. He spoke to him the words of God. He spoke to them saying, come to know the Lord. That's what I want you to know and what I want you to focus on. I want to tell you about God. I want to tell you about Christ being both man and God and how he's the ruler of this world. Follow him. That was my approach to you. That was, the, that was the message. That was the raw gospel that I gave you guys. That's all I wanted you to think about. And he could have just stopped there. He said, look, I just came to you with a gospel message. I didn't come to you with all this awesome stuff, with all this uh, smoke and lights. I didn't come to you with a massive following of people. Like, yes, yeah, so Paul, he's the guy. I just came to you to tell you about Jesus, about he's the only way to heaven, and how he's the joy that we're missing. And he takes it a step further. He says, and I was with you, meaning that I was amongst you in weakness. Weakness. Paul, weak. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. What, what in the world? <laughs> what does he mean? Well, Paul, people, what people were saying about him if you just go into the next book, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, it says that, for they say, this is Paul writing, telling that I know what people are saying about me. He says, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. Paul wasn't the most impressive looking guy. When he took the stage, it wasn't like he had a stage presence. It wasn't like Arnold Schwarzenegger walking up here. There was no celebrity status to him. He was just an average guy. Just a normal dude who didn't speak the best. He wrote well, but didn't speak well. He also was blind, or going blind. He says in Galatians 6.11, he says, See that I write to you with large letters. I am writing you with my own hand. He had, he had a physical ailment to him. And then on top of that, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 10, he talks about how he had some, um, some type of thorn in his side, some physical ailment to him that he prayed to the Lord, please take away, it bothers me. It brings weakness to me. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast more than gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He could have just ended there, but he just keeps going. He is opening himself up and showing the world. He is showing these people who he is, because they are putting him up here. They are deifying almost these, him. It's like, oh, well, Paul. He's like, no. He says, I came to you in weakness and in fear and trembling. Now, that is a strange Aspect for Paul in fear and trembling. Meaning that there was anxiety to this man. That though he speaks much boldly and he tells people, don't be afraid, it doesn't mean that he didn't feel it either. In fact, so much so that in Acts, when you see him in Acts chapter 18, when he actually, when it talks about him going to the church of the Corinthians, when he actually goes to them, in chapter 18, verses, uh, in chapter 18, verses 9 through 11, the Lord had to appear to him and, say, and, say, and says this, and the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be prideful, no, he said, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you. For I may have many, if I have many in this, in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. 
Paul is saying, I am not perfect. There's a great anxiety going out and preaching to the Gentiles. I mean, the guy was a, was a Jew. He was raised up in a, in, in a Jewish mindset. He had, um, he, was great, he had a nice status. He was a teacher. But he had to leave that comfort zone and go to speak to the Gentiles. The complete opposite spectrum of where he came from. And there was anxiety with him. But it didn't conquer him. And that's the key. It didn't conquer him. So he continues and says, My speech and my message, not in plausible words. So again, he's just reiterating the fact that, look, I didn't come to you with the greatest way of going about it. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of bells and whistles to convince you. But you know what did convince you, he says? But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. A better, way of tra- a better translation would be in the demonstration of the Spirit of power. Now, what does that mean? Because Corinthians, everyone likes to know and think and thinks like, well, you know, they deal with tongues and healings and all these spiritual gifts. But in the context, what Paul is referring to The demonstration of the power was the fact that people's lives were being changed by the mere words he spoke, by the gospel, by the raw gospel. Men's hearts were being convicted by this man who had a weak bodily presence, by this man who had physical ailments, by this man who, and he says, when I was with you in fear and trembling, they probably saw that. But people were 